Welcome to Alaska Weather, a production of Alaska Public Media and the National Weather Service, Alaska Region. Produced and broadcast daily from the studios of KAKM, Alaska Weather provides complete forecasts, public, marine, and aviation for all of Alaska. Alaska Weather is made possible by the following sponsors. If you are interested in serving on your local federal subsistence regional advisory council, the deadline to apply is Friday, March 21st. The councils provide information and recommendations to the federal subsistence board on subsistence hunting, trapping, and fishing. For more information on the advisory councils and how to apply, call 1-800-478 one four five six or email subsistence at fws.gov this message sponsored by u.s fish and wildlife service you can tell a lot about a company by where it invests at conoco phillips we're investing in arctic science and engineering at the university of alaska anchorage and we're supporting today's students and tomorrow's engineers at uaf in fact today more than 100 of our employees are university of alaska graduates and our future is in their hands. We happen to think that's a pretty good investment. ConocoPhillips, Alaska's oil and gas company. The National Weather Service. Good Wednesday, everyone. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder with the National Weather Service. It's the 12th of March. As always, we encourage you to stay up to date with the latest watches, warnings, and advisories, current observations, satellite images, and, of course, a look at the radar, as you can uh, find around Alaska anywhere, at weather.gov slash Alaska or arh.noaa.gov. Call us on the weather info line. Find us on many areas in social media, including Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube all day long. Here's a look at the hazardous weather situation now across southern Alaska. Nothing going right now across southeast, even with some of the heavier rainfall uh, in places like Klawak. More on that in just a minute. Instead, let's focus on what's going on around uh, south central. We have uh, watches out now for Kodiak and for the western parts of the Kenai Peninsula. These are uh, blizzard watches at this point. And uh, the blizzard watch for uh, the Kodiak area it does include one to three inches of snow. It's mainly due to uh, the northwesterly winds that are expected to start up as we head into Thursday. Uh, probably uh, sustained winds up to 45 miles an hour are possible there. For the western Kenai Peninsula, four to eight inches of snow possible in that region, especially for the Kashimak Bay and the Homer Bluff region. And we're talking about that setting in around Thursday into uh, Friday. And as a result of some of the stronger winds there, uh, perhaps coming out of the south and west, up to uh, 35 to 45 miles per hour, uh, that could really drop the visibility fairly quickly. Uh, as we look further north with the Deltana and Tananaw Flats region, under a wind advisory, uh, that'll continue into Friday as well. Uh, some stronger gusts there, uh, upwards of 60 to 75 miles per hour, the strongest of which, of course, uh, through the Alaska Range passes. Uh, and it looks like the, those areas now are under a high wind warning as we go toward the end of the week. Looking a little bit further north, you'll notice the wind chill advisories and warnings have been dropped for the western Arctic coast, so conditions have eased somewhat there. Meanwhile, that wind is still working its way southward, and as that meets up with uh, wetter air across uh, the Yukon Valley, uh, the Yukon Delta, and eastern parts of Norton Sound, uh, we're seeing accumulating snow and probably poor visibility as a result of that. Uh, so many areas there under winter weather advisories and winter storm warnings there. The advisories are in yellow. The warnings, of course, are in red. Uh, so that does include uh, many sections of the historic Iditarod Trail. So uh, again, if uh, uh, people are heading in that direction or coming and going, uh, the conditions could be a little bit more difficult than normal uh, along travel along those routes or even a flying weather for that matter. Uh, so it looks like uh, many areas around the lower to middle Yukon, out toward the uh, Yukon Delta, probably dealing with uh, anywhere from four to six, maybe even eight inches of snow in some cases there, uh, lesser amounts as you head out uh, north of Bethel. As you get into south and west, uh, winter weather advisories continue around the Bristol Bay region, uh, probably uh, expecting about one to three inches of snow in some areas there. Um, the winter storm warning for the, uh, or the blizzard warning, I should say, for the Alaska Peninsula is still in effect. Those northerly winds will continue up to about 45 miles per hour. Uh, conditions will gradually ease as we head into uh, Thursday. And winter weather advisory for the eastern Aleutians will wrap up our uh, watch warning and advisory chart here. Uh, we're expecting that to subside as we get into Thursday morning as well. Uh, light accumulations of snow, maybe another inch or so, 
Uh, northerly winds, though, could gust upwards of 50 miles per hour. So an awful lot going on on both sides of the storm as that's working its way into the western Gulf. And you can see the tail end of the system working across the eastern Aleutians. Uh, as this system is working its way into the western Gulf, it's dragging in a wealth of northerly winds. That's been creating that snow across the eastern chain and also across the Alaska Peninsula and certainly across the lower Yukon Valley there. We've got another circulation that's clearly visible out around Shemia. We've seen some light snow with that today, uh, but the main uh, storm that's really uh, creating quite a stir across south and western Alaska is the system that's still in the Pacific at this point. Another burst of moisture, as you saw there in the last frame, coming off of eastern Asia. Uh, the rest of Alaska, southeast catching a little bit of a break before the next wave sets in as we head into tomorrow and uh, the rest of the week. You'll notice that south and westerly flow working over Kodiak Island. That's going to become a little bit stronger from the south and east as we go, uh, working its way northward in the south central with uh, some heavy snowfall potential there and blizzard conditions again for Kodiak. Uh, snow and wind continuing mainly north, of King, north and west of King Salmon as we saw today. Uh, most of the interior, including the Tanana Valley, relatively clear at this point. Partly to mostly cloudy skies expected for the next couple of days, but it doesn't look like you're going to be dealing with really anything more than wind probably through the passes, uh, the Delta and Tanana Flats region and the Alaska Range, and uh, through most of areas uh, east of uh, Toke, I believe. Across the Arctic coast, the conditions are cold, but uh, not a whole lot of snow seems to be falling. You might catch some flurries and brief snow showers from time to time. And the west coast, again, still dealing with accumulating snow and wind to blow it around. So uh, not very nice conditions there for all those around the historic Iditarod Trail. Low pressure around the Kotzebue Sound region at 990 millibars, uh, holding back some of that cold air across the west from swinging into the interior at this point. That warmer air trying to work northward, relatively dry air here and a lot of wind moving across the Alaska range getting ready to set up. You can see that pressure pattern really packing in across the western Gulf. For southeast, a ridge of high pressure now, a little bit of light rain across southern parts of southeast earlier today. Uh, but the big storm on the map is the 968 millibar low that's working its way on the south side of the Alaska Peninsula toward Kodiak Island where there were some areas of rain and snow today. Now by tonight, the low pressure is uh, up to about 973, so it's filling in a little bit. Uh, the triple point low approaching uh, northern parts of the Gulf. Uh, out ahead of that, probably areas of heavier rainfall starting to set in. We'll have an opportunity for some rain and uh, snow to start moving back into southeast. The heaviest snow though, uh, probably across the Alaska Range, uh, the Alaska Peninsula, and moving toward Kodiak Island. There is of snow and blowing snow across the west coast and lower middle Yukon Valley, the YK Delta, Amonic probably looking at more accumulating snow. Same goes for snow or for the southern Seward Peninsula coast. Uh, you might see some accumulating snow in that region and through eastern Norton Sound. Don't be surprised to run into some blowing and drifting areas of snow even uh, outside of where it's actually falling. So the farther north you go into the Brooks Range, uh, you're probably dealing with some poor visibility from time to time. There's that weak area of low pressure out across the western Aleutians. It uh, really doesn't look like it amounts to a whole lot. There may be some steady snow uh, for parts of the central and western chain, but uh, it doesn't look like the winds are terribly strong with that at this point, although it is going to allow some colder air to organize behind it and drop into the North Pacific. So as we get into Thursday, low pressure still south of Kodiak Island. Here's our occlusion now is working into the north and eastern Gulf. We've got a much stronger south and uh, easterly flow. Uh, coming up through the, uh, the southeastern archipelago. Heavier rainfall probably focusing back on that area as well as uh, some accumulating snow now setting up across the Chugach and across the Alaska Range. And we'll see what happens as we get into Thursday night and Friday, but it does look like there's an opportunity for accumulating snow in some parts of south central as well, including the Anchorage Bowl area into the Matsu. Uh, probably dealing with an awful lot of wind first though, especially for the Turnigan Arm and uh, probably around some of the uh, mountain areas and, and the passes there in the Kenai. For Kodiak Island, low pressures just to your south and east. That's going to mean a lot of wind for you, so the blizzard watch again in effect for the western parts of the Kenai and Kodiak Island. And we're still looking at a stronger northwesterly flow coming across the Alaska Range and a pretty tight wind pattern coming through the Bering Strait, now the western parts of the Brooks Range, uh, Norton Sound, and the YK Delta. So the conditions that you have tonight and tomorrow probably still upon us as we get into the end of Thursday. Conditions improve a little bit as we head into Friday with low pressure weakening somewhat across the Seward Peninsula. Uh, still looking at an opportunity for snow. There's snow showers across the Alaska Range into the Kuskokwim Valley. And then things really dry up as you head north of the Alaska Range, probably still dealing with some gusty winds across Denali, the eastern parts of the Alaska Range, the Deltana and Tanana Flats region, and rain and snow for parts of southeast. The wind should subside somewhat there. 
Notice we've got another system across the southern Gulf. That's at 984 millibars. Warm air is trying to work its way northward once again. And yet another system lined up out in the west at 968 millibars. It won't quite make it to Attu by Friday afternoon. Snow showers continue for the Alaska Peninsula. The winds will have let up by then. And the central and eastern chain still dealing with scattered snow showers. More of that as well for the Pribilovs. Uh, visibility may come and go, but it doesn't look uh, like a terrible wind situation for you. And the ice edge, again, uh, starting to ascend strips out flirting with St. Paul Island. So it's close enough now that the ice strips are getting uh, a little bit nearer to uh, the St. Paul coastline, but the ice edge itself, not quite there. So a lot of things happening all around the state from precipitation to the ice out in the Bering Sea. Temperature wise, uh, upper 30s to mid 40s across parts of southeast today. Places like Klawak and Craig and Juneau all above that 40 degree mark easily today. Around Prince William Sound, mid to upper 30s. Valdez showing 32, 35 in Homer and Seward, 29 in Kenai. Attempts around Anchorage, 31, about the same there for Matsu and Palmer, 30 in Talkeetna. Into the Alaska Range in Denali, 34 degrees there, 20 in Fairbanks, 38 in Tok, 45 in Eagle. A mild day for sure. And then you get north of the Yukon and temperatures drop into the teens and 20s, but still not too bad around Ambler and Bettles, uh, anywhere from the single digits to the upper teens. 19 around Arctic Village, th 8 below for Kaktovik, 10 below in Barrow. Atkasuk was 12 below, Wainwright about the same. Constabu Sound temperatures showing readings between 5 and 10 below, Nome 6 above. And the eastern Norton Sound region with snow and wind, single digit territory there all the way into Galena at 18 degrees, 1 above in uh, Grayling. Uh, Spiravon was 17, 4 above in uh, Bethel, 8 below in St. Lawrence Island. As you get out toward the southwest coast with snow and wind today, especially again west of King Salmon, uh, temperatures were in the teens and 20s, so not the nicest of days for you. 20s and 30s for the Alaska Peninsula and the eastern chain. The Pribilovs hovering close to 10 and low to mid 20s for the central and western parts of the chain. Uh, Attu and Shemya up to about 28 with Kodiak Island in the upper 30s. Overnight low temperatures will remain in the 20s for the chain, uh, teens and 20s for the Alaska Peninsula, 37 in Kodiak with wind developing, 20s and 30s for South Central, 30s for most of Southeast, single digits and teens for the interior, and then colder, of course, north of the Yukon, you're looking at single digits, even a few places, sub-zero like Port Yukon, the Arctic Coast between 15 and 25 below, uh, the YK Delta between 5 and 15 below, and that does not factor in wind chills, of course, Nome looking at 14 below with a high tomorrow of 6. And uh, more areas of staying above freezing during the daytime tomorrow, all the way from Ambler, Bettles, uh, even the places like Contibu Sound. Uh, once you get inland just a little bit, those temperatures just really soar. Uh, lower 30s around uh, even mid 30s for McGrath. Uh, King Salmon and Dillingham still a little bit on the colder side, sh uh, showing up closer to 40 for Kodiak. South Central, upper 30s. Prince William Sound looking at temps that are above freezing. And it uh, looks like Denali could make it to 42 degrees. Any area that's on the lee side of a high terrain, uh, anywhere in the interior and south central, the air is moving uh, from south to north. You're looking at a pretty good setup for some uh, downslope warming there. So uh, expect some warm but windy conditions. And for southeast, low to mid 40s there, Sitka about 45, uh, Craig, Klawak, Petersburg, all in the mid 40s tomorrow. Flying weather then along the Gulf Coast and uh, certainly across southeast. Prince William Sound, Kodiak Island, and then uh, spotty areas up the west coast through the Seward Peninsula and even the Chukchi Seacoast looking at a very uh, healthy dose of IFR conditions there. The interior should be fine. Uh, areas around the Pribilovs looking at IFR conditions and most of the chain and the southern tip of the Alaska Peninsula looking at MVFR. Pass conditions, Anaktuvik and Adigan Pass, we expect to be VFR. Lake Clark and Merrill Pass, not only uh, turbulence issues, but visibility issues tomorrow at IFR. Rainy Pass, also expected to see some heavy precipitation and IFR conditions there. Windy Pass, likely VFR, but the chop will probably uh, make you think twice. Isabel Pass, uh, VFR conditions are expected. Mentasta Pass, also visual flight rule. Tanita Pass, MVFR. Same goes for Portage Pass. IFR on the eastern side with VFR in the western side, and the low-level winter will probably be tough tomorrow. Chilkoot and White Pass also expected to be IFR conditions as we go into Thursday. Freezing levels show that warm and wet air working its way and just taking over the Gulf really and spreading out surface freezing line very close to the Kenai Peninsula, still north of Kodiak and into Bristol Bay and south of the Aleutian Chain at this point. Icing potential shows that any area mainly along the west coast will have an opportunity for some light to isolated moderate, generally below 10,000 feet, a much better chance with more moisture available at higher levels below 12,000 but above 6,000 feet for occasional moderate along the eastern and northern parts of the Gulf Coast probably see some spotty reports across south central as well. 
Why is the weather changing? Well, low pressures dropped into the Bering Sea and developed a pretty healthy trough here, sending a south to north flow right across the heart of Alaska and the Brooks Range and into the Arctic. The main core of the jet stream is still well to our south, but pieces of that have organized and moved into southeast, so we're going to keep the rain potential there. 9,000 feet shows that south and southeasterly flows working through the 49th state. Across southeast, you see winds up to 45 knots. Across the west coast, 25 to 35 knots, wrapping into the low pressure system south of St. Lawrence Island, and a northwesterly flow across the Aleutians. You'll find that at 3,000 feet as well. With low pressure south of Kodiak Island, southeasterly strengthened, coming over the Alaska Range to 35 knots sustained, and about the same there around the Brooks Range, with wind speeds between 5 uh, and maybe 10 knots or so south of the uh, Brooks Range. Uh, in the Yukon Flats and then picking up speed north of the Brooks Range summits to about 25 to 30 knots coming in from the south and east across the Arctic coast. Turbulence potential. Tomorrow could be a pretty nasty day to fly if you're in south and western parts of Alaska, south central or across the Gulf Coast. Expect some uh, wide areas of low level wind shear and probably developing areas of uh, turbulence across southeast throughout the daytime tomorrow below 6,000 feet, below 10,000 feet across southwest and below 10,000 feet for parts of the uh, Kuskokwim and lower Yukon valleys and below 4,000 feet for the central Brooks Range and out to the west into Kotzebue Sound. You can see all these maps and more anytime by going to our website at weather.gov slash anchorage and look for TV desk on the left hand side of your screen. We'll be back in just a few minutes with a look at your marine weather. Stay tuned. What is it about the ocean that attracts so many of us? We like to play in it, get our food from it, build our houses near it, and gaze out at it. Our economy depends on the goods that come in and go out through our major ports. The ocean makes us feel good, contributes to our economic growth, and we like to be close to it. It's not surprising then that almost half of our population lives near the coastline, but working and playing along the coast is not always serene. Powerful coastal storms can raise the water level significantly, 20 feet or even more, causing loss of life, destroying homes, businesses, and property. Hurricanes like Katrina and Ike showed us firsthand the risks that coastal communities face. It was 32 feet. We went through the first floor to the second floor, through the attic. The water came up to us like here on the roof, and we talking about swimming to the tree, and luckily it subsided. With ocean waters warming and sea levels rising, it is likely that the U.S. will encounter future storms equally as harmful and costly. And with so many people living along the coast, the stakes are getting higher each year. Storm destruction is rarely limited to lost lives and property. Instruments collecting water level and meteorological information must be located in harm's way so they can deliver data critical for flooding forecasts and emergency evacuations. But all too often, these stations are damaged or destroyed during the very times we need them. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, has responded to this dilemma by strengthening some of its storm tide stations. Known as NOAA Sentinels of the Coast, these platforms are single pile, four feet in diameter structures that stand at least 20 feet above the sea surface and are driven 60 to 100 feet into the seafloor for stability. For over 200 years, NOAA has monitored the rise and fall of tides using the latest technology. Beginning with human observers in the early 19th century, NOAA has harnessed technology to operate its network of tide stations that automatically collect accurate and reliable data every six minutes. Today, NOAA maintains more than 200 permanent water level observing stations. NOAA's goal is to ensure that the public has advance notice based on the most accurate and up-to-date storm tide and meteorological information. This is only possible, however, when the tide stations operate throughout the storm. So Sentinels are designed to withstand a Category 4 hurricane with winds up to 155 miles per hour and storm surges of nearly 20 feet above normal. Planning, design, construction, and operation required a team of experts in surveying, engineering, pile installation, oceanography, quality control, and web expertise. With new technology, NOAA is better meeting the needs of coastal communities. Lives are often at stake during the 24 hours before a major storm. 
Once floodwaters begin to rise, it becomes critical to know which evacuation routes are passable. Having this kind of immediate real-time data up close that our community has access to is critical for us in our day-to-day -day operations. Each sentinel will report real-time water level and meteorological observations. Water level measurements are precisely referenced to ensure that coastal communities can make informed decisions to elevate housing, build levees, and plan evacuation routes. In addition to storm tide reporting, the products that result from NOAA's instruments also contribute to safe navigation, accurate charting, marine engineering, sea level change monitoring, and other important activities. Before we send crews out, we always check the ties, because being in South Louisiana, you have to make sure your, your barges and boats can get in before you can even begin your, begin your work. So the tide information is very important. The first sentinels were constructed along the Gulf Coast at Calcasieu Pass, Amarada Pass, and Shell Beach in Louisiana, and Bay Waveland in Mississippi. Hurricanes Gustav and Ike tested the sentinels within weeks of installation. Standing strong, they delivered storm tide data, which were used by emergency responders as well as thousands of coastal residents. More sentinels are planned and will be built at exposed coastal locations as funding becomes available. Other stations in less exposed areas will be elevated above storm surge range on substantial structures. Coastal communities must be ever vigilant. Even tropical storms can deal a massive blow to many residents, especially storms that make landfall on a high tide. Sentinels are designed to serve the over 150 million residents of coastal communities, planning for the worst and hoping that we never need those plans. However, if the unthinkable happens, NOAA Sentinels will be there standing tall, providing a safe haven for instruments that are vital to planning for and responding to nature's fury. Once again, across southeast, the winds will be picking up across the coastal areas, 40 to 45 knots with higher gusts in the region. Seas also rising to 22 feet around Icy Cape and Cape Fairweather to about 17 feet outside of the Dixon entrance. Six-foot seas across some of the uh, inner uh, waterways there, 30-knot winds from the south and east, more of a southerly flow around Frederick Sound and Stevens Passage. And southerlies on Thursday up to 15 knots in the Lynn Canal with a three-foot sea. Uh, that's uh, climbing to 25 knots as we get into Friday. Uh, still looking at a south and southeasterly flow on the inside passages there. Four to seven foot seas are expected the farther south you go. Those seas will climb out toward the entrances. And then an onshore flow develops as that next wave uh, comes up to the coast. Anywhere from uh, 25 knots from the west to uh, 25 knots from the south and west across some of the northern and eastern Gulf. Seas anywhere from 17 to 21 feet depending on where you are with the highest seas across the northern Gulf Coast. Across South Central, easterlies inside and outside of Prince William Sound. Uh, it looks like 45 knots there outside of Prince William Sound with higher gusts around the Copper River Basin, of course, and very close to the coastline. You get out away from the coast a little bit, the wind should back down. A southeasterly flow coming into Seward and into uh, Resurrection Bay and also across the Barren Islands, 20 knots with a 16 to 18 foot sea. A southeasterly flow at 25 knots coming into uh, Kodiak Island with a 15 foot sea. There are easterlies inside of Shelikoff Strait and west of the Barren Islands and more of an east and northeasterly flow coming down the northern parts of the Cook Inlet around 20 knots with a 3 to 5 foot sea. The flow reverses course on Friday. You're looking at much stronger flow coming across the Barren Islands, 40 to 45 knots, 45 knots east of Kodiak with higher gusts in the region, looking at more of a southerly flow coming into Prince William Sound and turning into uh, uh, places like Whittier from the south and east with a six foot sea. Westerlies coming into Anchorage at 35 knots with a 10 foot sea on Friday thanks to low pressure situating right about here. So again, a possibility of some snow with that as well. Northwesterlies across the Alaska Peninsula as we get into Thursday, 35 to 40 knot winds, 16 to 17 foot seas on the Pacific side, 10 to 11 foot seas on the Bering side. Uh, freezing spray will be a threat as we go into Friday as well. 25 to 35 knots with 8 to 10 foot seas on the Bering 
Uh, 20 to 30 knot winds from the west across the Pacific with 10 to 13 foot seas expected again with freezing spray. Across the Aleutians, look for more of a north and westerly flow reaching the Bering Sea side. As you get into the Pacific, that's more of a west and northwesterly flow. 25 to 35 knot winds there, 20 to 25 knot winds across the west and west central chain. 10 to 11 foot seas are expected with more of a southwesterly de flow developing on Friday around 25 knots with a 9 foot sea. Across the central and eastern parts of the chain, a north and northwesterly flow should be expected still running around 25 to 30 knots. Across the west coast, expect 25 knot winds around St. Lawrence Island, 35 knot winds around Nunavak Island, and the same goes for the Kuskokwim uh, Delta area. More of a northwesterly flow for the Pribilovs with a 7-foot sea. Once again, ice strips just kind of uh, flirting with the uh, St. Paul Island area right now. The main ice edge still a little bit farther north. A north and northwesterly flow continues on Friday, 20 to 30 knots with a 6 to 8-foot sea uh, south of Nunavak Island and toward the Pribilovs with a 8-foot sea closer to the Pribilovs itself. Across the Arctic coast, easterly is wrapping around to Point Barrow and then moving north and east and into Kotzebue Sound on a northerly flow. Wind speeds from 15 to 25 knots on the Chukchi, 15 to 20 knots across the Beaufort Sea coast. A little bit of a change in variation on Friday, but uh, not a whole lot different. 20 to 25 knot winds for the Chukchi Sea coast and still looking at easterlies from 25 knots around Kaktovik there with ice up against the shore. And looking at our weather map once again for tonight, an active period for the south and western parts of the state. A little bit of a break in the rain for southeast, but more is on the way. Some of that could become heavy once again. And wind setting up for south central with wind and snow continuing uh, for the west coast, Norton Sound, and the Seward Peninsula. So as we put this uh, into Thursday mode here, 977 millibar low getting closer to Kodiak Island under a blizzard watch. Same goes for the western parts of the Kenai Peninsula. Winter weather advisories for uh, Bristol Bay and uh, blizzard conditions continue for uh, the Alaska Peninsula with winter weather advisories slowly winding down into the morning for the eastern parts of the chain with winter weather advisories for uh, the western part of the state as well. We're looking for the uh, potential for wind and snow for south central with more rain in southeast as we get into Friday and accumulating snow still possible around the eastern parts of Norton Sound. All these maps and the latest watches and warnings anytime at weather.gov slash Alaska. Thanks for watching Alaska Weather. These forecasts are to be used for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go flying. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbor master before you go boating. Alaska weather is made possible by the following sponsors. The National Weather Service. If you are interested in serving on your local federal subsistence regional advisory council, the deadline to apply is Friday, March 21st. The councils provide information and recommendations to the federal subsistence board on subsistence hunting, trapping, and fishing. For more information on the advisory councils and how to apply, call 1-800-478-1456 or email subsistence at fws.gov. This message sponsored by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. It's never too early to set expectations and goals for your child's education. The UA College Savings Plan provides opportunities that can help you reach your educational savings goals. Save in Alaska. Study anywhere. There is more information available by calling 1-888, the number 4, and then Alaska. This message sponsored by the UA College Savings Plan.